Welcome back to Tales from Our Dark Past. Today's story takes us back to the centre of London during the mid-19th century. It was 1858 and London was a busy and bustling place to be. The streets were crowded and the city was hard at work, ever evolving and adjusting to the Industrial Revolution and the technological advances of the times. London's population had been growing rapidly over the previous centuries, with records showing that the population was estimated to be around half a million at the end of the 17th century, but that it had more than doubled to over one million people by 1800. By 1858, London was busier than ever. Luxury stores like Harrods had just opened and street markets flourished. The British Museum had already been fascinating visitors for some time, and London's famous West End Theatre District was keeping audiences entertained. During the 19th century, London was the wealthiest and most powerful city in the entire world, and it seemed like it must be one of the best places to live during the times. But the reality of life in London couldn't be further from that image. London was plagued by an awful secret. It was absolutely filthy. Beneath the glamour of the West End and the prestige portrayed by the royal family and the wealthy, the city of London was actually disgustingly dirty. The capital was forever expanding and the population continued to grow rapidly throughout the century. The city couldn't handle the amount of people that lived and worked there. The streets were overcrowded and full of filthy, unwashed, sweaty bodies wearing dirty clothing and working long, hard days. The wealthy would have had slightly better access to water to wash with, but London's poorer population would have had to have made do with buckets of water that had been collected from local pumps for all of their water needs. These pumps were often run by landlords or churches and sometimes would only be switched on for a few hours a week. Many workers would try to wash themselves in rivers and ponds when given the chance as water was so limited. The stench of body odour alone must have been overpowering enough, but the streets of London also stunk to high heaven of soot and smoke from the billowing fumes of factories and domestic coal fires. The mass burning of coal throughout London created a disgusting and suffocating smog which filled the air and blanketed everything it touched with soot. Sheep were said to turn from white to black within just days of entering the capital, and horses filled the streets, leaving trowels of droppings and puddles of urine wherever they went. But nothing compared to the stench that came from the River Thames, which in the 1800s was basically just a giant sewer which flowed through London. The river had been used by the population for centuries as an easy way to dump their waste and all early sewer systems emptied directly into the river. Many of those in poorer communities who lived by the river would often have no other choice but to get their water by lowering a bucket directly into the Thames. This dirty sewage water was then used for everything from drinking to washing and cooking, resulting in thousands of deaths from disease throughout the century. Even if you were wealthy, you could fall victim to the foul, contaminated water that ran through the city. Nobody was safe from London's disgusting dirt problem. Charles Dickens even wrote that the River Thames was a deadly sewer in the place of a fine, fresh river. All of this must have made life in London unbearable enough but the stench problem the city faced reached a terrifying and unpleasant peak for those who had to suffer through it, when Britain experienced an unusually hot summer in 1858. The London streets were sweltering, 
the population was suffering from the effects of the extreme heat wave. With no modern air conditioning or fans to help cool off, there was little they could do to get relief. The temperature hit 48 degrees Celsius at its height in June 1858, and there had been an unfortunately low amount of rainfall that year. This caused the water level in the River Thames to drop significantly, revealing its disgusting history for all of London to see. Raw, untreated sewage, dead animals, rotting food, rubbish and toxic waste was steadily brewing underneath the scorching sun. One journalist estimated that in parts of the River Thames foreshore, the filth deposits were over six feet deep. The smell was sickening and the entire city was suffering from what the press was calling the Great Stink. London was being haunted by the stomach-churning smells that plagued the city. And lack of information during the 1800s led the people to believe that the deadly diseases and sicknesses that struck them were caused by inhaling the putrid fumes. It was a scary time to be a Londoner, and fear spread quickly throughout the communities. People were scared to breathe in the bad air, and there was little they could do to escape the dreadful smells coming from the River Thames. Londoners were terrified that breathing in the foul air would make them gravely ill, and the population retreated into their homes to try to flee from the tormenting stench. They would draw thick, heavy curtains that had been soaked in lime to try to mask and lock out the deadly smells, but it did little to ease their suffering. The city was spending up to £1,500 a week at the height of the problem on trying to combat the vile smells with lime. That's over £150,000 in today's money, according to the Bank of England's inflation calculator. Lime was placed around the failing sewers exits along the River Thames, and men were employed with the unpleasant job of walking along the foreshore during low tide to spread as much lime as they possibly could. But their attempts barely made a difference to the disgusting stench. Londoners lived in constant fear. They soaked their homes with lime and clutched rags and handkerchiefs to their noses wherever they went. The severity of London's filth problem was felt by all classes. The poor, the wealthy, and even royalty couldn't escape the clutches of the Thames' foul odour. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert even had to call short one of their regular Thames river cruises, as the smell was so repulsive that they had to return to shore just moments after they set off. The Palace of Westminster had been undergoing expensive renovations after a terrible fire in 1834, and the impressive riverside building became the Houses of Parliament. But even the members of Parliament couldn't stomach the awful stench and strongly considered abandoning the building before it was even finished. The horrendous smell from the River Thames was enough to affect the government's work. The thick, lime-drenched curtains made little difference and the grand rooms and library became unusable due to the rotten stench. Serious discussions were had about whether to move the head of parliament to St Albans or Oxford in a cowardly attempt to get away from the problem and its obvious overwhelming stink. Those in charge were reluctant to do little more than to try to mask the stench as they knew that tackling the deadly river would be a huge and costly task. The famous English scientist Michael Faraday had even warned of the danger that lurked beneath the River Thames just three years prior. In 1855, the respected physicist and chemist Michael Faraday took a steamboat cruise along the River Thames. Between 1.30 and 2 p.m. during low tide, he travelled between London Bridge and Hungerford Bridge, assessing the river's water. 
He experimented by placing pieces of white card into the river at every pier that their boat came to along the way. Then he witnessed how quickly the paper's colour and appearance changed. Faraday claimed that the paper had practically disappeared from visibility before even reaching an inch below the water's murky surface. He was so concerned about what he saw during that short boat trip down the Thames that he wrote out his worrying observations in a letter and sent it to the Times newspaper. He first stated that the appearance and smell of the water forced themselves at once on my attention. And he declared that the whole of the river was an opaque, pale brown fluid before detailing his experiments and concerns. He then stated that the whole river was for the time a real sewer. He concluded his letter by saying that, I have thought it a duty to record these facts, that they may be brought to the attention of those who exercise power or have responsibility in relation to the condition of our river. There is nothing figurative in the words I have employed or any approach to exaggeration. They are the simple truth. And Faraday was right in what he said. This was the simple and horrifying truth that the once great and magnificent city of London was rapidly turning into a giant cesspool. But still, it wasn't until three years later, during the scorching summer of 1858, that lawmakers finally couldn't ignore the repulsive and deadly water of the River Thames any longer. It took the deaths of thousands from contaminated water and the overwhelming unpleasantness of the great stink to finally force the hands of those in charge into taking action. Although they had been reluctant to do so at first, It seems that the Houses of Parliament being located directly on the River Thames meant that the politicians themselves were suffering at the fumes of the toxic and revolting water. It took just a mere 18 days for lawmakers to create and pass a bill for the river's overhaul. It seems they couldn't ignore the issue any longer when confronted with it on their doorsteps. Plans to reform the Thames consisted of building embankments along the river and creating an entire new and up-to-date sewer system that would be able to cope with London's growing population for generations to come. Sewage was pumped away from the city through elaborate sewer systems and pump stations. The new sewers were lined with bricks and strong cement. It was an impressive display of Victorian engineering, with many surviving still to this day. The ambitious project was estimated to end up costing around six and a half million pounds by the time it was completed in 1875. That's over half a billion pounds today. It took 318 million bricks to complete the building works and the sheer amount of workers needed to build this new infrastructure also drove builders' wages up by 20%. The wretched, stench-filled lives of the London population slowly began to improve. The unbearable smell of the great stink gradually decreased as the much-needed embankments and sewer systems were finally built. Although the deadly and horrendous stench of the 1858 Great Stink was truly awful, it seemed that it was a necessary evil in human history that shone a light onto a problem that was always going to occur. It led to great leaps of progress in how Britain handled waste management, and the new and improved River Thames helped to wipe out the deadly diseases and unsanitary conditions that had plagued the nation for centuries. Today, London's crucial sewer system is once again struggling to cope with its ever-growing population, which has rapidly increased to over 8 million residents that now call the city their home. The challenging task of keeping the River Thames clean has continued ever since the Great Stink in 1858, with the now struggling sewers still releasing millions of tonnes of dirty raw sewage into the River Thames every year. 
A new £4.5 million super sewer is currently being built in London and is set to open and be fully functional in 2025. The massive project, named the Thames Tideway Tunnel, will help clean up the River Thames and secure the future of London sewers once again for generations to come. Thank you for watching. If you found this video interesting, please remember to like and subscribe. It will be a massive help to our new channel and we really appreciate you taking the time to hit that subscribe button. Goodbye for now and see you next time for another chilling tale from our dark past.